The ocean's fish stocks are disappearing fast. Our insatiable appetite for a small selection of marine species like cod and tuna has decimated our seas. If we don't do something about it now, in the next 30 to 50 years, we will have hardly any fish at all left in our oceans. We need to find sustainable alternatives. And I believe the pages of history could hold the solution. Our ancestors ate much more widely from the sea. And there's a treasure chest of alternative marine cuisine just waiting to be rediscovered. Well, I want to show people that there's a whole new world of totally delicious seafood out there. And to prove it, I'm laying on a once-in-a-lifetime fishy feast. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm going to reinvent familiar favourites and hunt down completely new sustainable delights. That's good shit. <laughs> This is a food odyssey like nothing you've seen before. The sea cucumber yes. could be the new cod. So roll over, Captain Birdseye. There's a new salty sea dog in town. No way! So will you stop it with the sea bird shit? As a three Michelin starred chef, I've spent a career dedicated to celebrating the finest fish and seafood our oceans have to offer. But tragically, this could soon be a thing of the past. The same big five species, cod, haddock, tuna, salmon and prawns, make up 80% of all the fish we eat in the UK. But obliterated stocks mean we need to find alternatives. And there's one place I believe we can look to for answers, and that's history. Our ancestors were far more adventurous in the range of seafood and fish that they ate. And they were incredibly creative in the way that they cooked it. When it comes to tucking into the full range of delights our oceans have to offer, our culinary forefathers had no boundaries. In ancient Rome, stuffed jellyfish and sea urchin custard were hailed as ultimate delicacies. At Tudor banquets, internal organs from leftover fish were used to make desserts. And in Victorian times, everything from sea slugs to barnacles and sea anemones were trialled at posh dinners. So by looking into the past, I believe that we can uncover the future of sustainable marine cuisine. So I'm laying on my ultimate fish supper. I've invited six guests to my fabulous feast, and I'm hoping to dazzle them with my incredible seafaring gastronomy. The feast tonight is fish, but, but there's a sustainable theme, which is a bit worrying. I think he might be serving us goldfish or something like that. I'm, I'm slightly nervous. I, don't, I hope there's no fish genitals. I, d I don't know if they have them, but I really hope there aren't any. I think sometimes maybe he's, uh, he's a bit too crazy for his own good. You know, and you think, OK, that's fine. You're alone in your room, your bald head, your glasses, mad scientist, freezing this, burning that, blowing this up. Lovely, but I'm going to have to eat it. For a fully immersive eating experience, I'm sending my diners 20,000 leagues under the sea to my unique underwater dining room. Wow. <laughs> it's like we're in a fish oh, tank. Wow. <laughs> Look at this. Look, it's just Oh, like... my God. Wow. Wow. Look at this. Wow. Great table. It's a great table. Oh, look, it's on Heston. A slightly gay diver. <laughs> Hi, yes, cheers. 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 On my menu tonight, a fishy Victorian afternoon tea with a side order of giggly gas. <laughs> my new take of seaside fish and chips served up with a rather saucy seagull. Oh, no! They're, they're carrying live ammunition. Oh. And my incredible edible coral reef dessert. Oh, my goodness. Crab biscuit is good. So it's time to set sail on my sustainable seafood adventure. And I'm kicking things off with a true British seafood institution. You don't have to delve too far back in history before you come across a wonderful British sustainable seafood that has sadly fallen out of favour, and that is scampi. 
In the 1970s, every pub table groaned with baskets of plump breaded scampi, but they're now somehow considered naff. Scampi are plentiful round our shores, but we ship tons off every day to the French, who love them. I'm determined to put this neglected classic back on the menu, and I'm using a bit of nostalgia to give it my own twist. I've got a wonderful memory of the first time I ever tried beer. I remember so clearly having a little half pint of shandy and a packet of these scampi fries. That great little kind of like a squashed pillow shape. But scampi is now considered as a pretty cheap and nasty ingredient. But how many people know that scampi is actually this? Langoustine. So what I want to do is take this and turn it into my ultimate scampi fry. Sustainable langoustine caught using creel baskets or pots are best. I start by removing the plump tail. It's chopped and mixed with sweet preserved lemon. Inside of that, I'm going to put one of these. It's a soft boiled quail's egg. So the idea is when my guests bite into the scampi stuffing, they'll get this wonderful, warm, liquid yolk. And for some real luxury, I'm surrounding my mini egg with wafer-thin slices of white truffle. What I'm now going to do is turn it into my ultimate scampi fry. I'm going to use the blitzed crumbs from the actual scampi fries to create a uniquely fishy crumb coating. This gives a perfect crisp texture once deep fried. So here is an original scampi fry, and here is my ultimate scampi fry. To top it off, I need to recreate that dinky half pint of shandy I remember so fondly. A langoustine and tomato consomme forms my shandy base. Now, obviously, every beer needs a head. And I'm using a celery foam. So here is my ultimate scampi fry and my ultimate scampi fry beer. Cheers. So, have I done enough to transform this naff 70s seafood into something befitting of my feast? Back in my galley, it's a nail-biting watch. <gasps> oh, it's the captain. Captain Birdseye. Please come over to the bar area and sample Captain Heston's scampi fries. Oh, lovely. Wow, look at that. It's just one giant scampi thing in there. Yeah. Mm. Oh, it smells good. Oh, wow. Smells good. Mm. Smells like scampi. Delicious. Oh, it's an egg in there. Oh, some it is isn't some it? sort of egg, isn't it? It's quail's egg. I love this. Who would have thought egg in the middle of your scampi? It's so it's delicious. delicious. But I loved it. It was great. It was good. Perhaps like your thirst. Hello, sir. Some Heston scampi <laughs> and served by my cabin boy. Oh, well, that's a little beer. Mm. It's like a sort of tiny baby beer, beer for you. Bottoms up. Yes. Yeah. Oh, no, what is it? I've never tasted anything quite like it. It says, do not give something. It's nice with this. This is 100% scampi. I thought that was unbelievably yeah. delicious. Very nice. It's fantastic. Do you know, he should, he should go into cooking. I really... He has a real flair. That was definitely fit for the captain's table. So, my delicious scampi fry proves just how much we're missing out on this native delight. But next, I'm risking shark-infested waters to create a Victorian starter in which nothing is quite what it seems. That's good shit. <laughs> that is good shit. Overfishing the same old species is destroying our seas. I'm looking to the far more varied seafaring cuisine of our ancestors to find alternatives for an incredible fishy feast. So ingenious. And I'm about to sail into uncharted waters with a starter that really pushes the boundaries of marine cuisine. Oh, yeah, I can really feel that now. I can really feel that now. Part of eating sustainably from our seas is about discovering new things. Finding a world far beyond that of tin tuna, fish fingers and packet prawns. It's about being more adventurous with your eating. 
And to me, there's always one place you can look to for inspiration on that front, and that is the Victorians. In Victorian times, adventurous eating clubs were all the rage, and one man, a four-foot zoologist called Frank Buckland, led the way, devouring everything from boiled elephant trunk to rhinoceros pie and stewed mole. At Buckland's most legendary feast, a bizarre sea creature found at the depths of the ocean floor was the star of the show. It was called a sea cucumber and was said by Buckland's guests to taste deliciously similar to the finest calf's head. Sea cucumber is something that the Victorians celebrated and they're found in British waters. This could be something totally delicious from our seas that we've just completely overlooked. And for me, that is an irresistible opportunity. Sea cucumbers thrive off British shores and plans are underway to farm them for food on the Scottish coast. I'm in Oban, deep in the Scottish Highlands. I'm on the search for one of the ocean's stranger creatures, the sea cucumber. I'm braving sharks and freezing water conditions just to get one. <coughs> I've done it again, haven't I? <coughs> Overexcited. Forgot to close my mouth. OK, so I'm really an open sea life centre, but with very good reason. My culinary hero, Frank Buckland, kept special fish tanks in his house, which he'd dip into for a really fresh, fishy treat. Paying homage to Frank, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Dive, dive, dive. The sea cucumber may sound like a vegetable that you chop into a seafood salad, but it's actually a marine animal related to the sea urchin and starfish. The lady loves sea cucumber. Judging by its appearance, it's going to be a huge challenge turning this weird creature into something my guests won't run a mile from. Helping me find out which bits taste best is marine biologist Dr Adam Hughes. Let's hope it tastes better than it looks. Okay, so what have, we, what have we got? What have we got here? These are Cuvarian tubercles, which are part of the gut of the animal. This is the bit the sea cucumber spits out when under attack. It looks like a cross between a spider's web and chewing gum. With a bit of Victorian grit, I'm going to have to give it a go. Recommend it. No. Next, I'm going to sample the muscular wall of the sea cucumber. This part is particularly savoured in many countries. It's a little bit crunchy, but flavours yeah, flavours are really nice. Really nice. Success! The Victorians might have been onto something after all. Finally, can I bring myself to sample the bright orange gonads of the sea cucumber? OK, certainly not tough. That's nice. Flavours, yeah, flavours are really nice. Certainly there's two bits of that that uh, I would happily eat any day. The sea cucumber tastes great, but I've got a massive problem on my hands with its appearance. If I'm going to use this strange sea creature in my feast, I've got to find a way of drawing out its flavour, but without freaking my guests out by the way it looks. So, I'm going to attempt to disguise the sea cucumber as something else quintessentially Victorian. I've hit upon an idea and an opulent tea room is the perfect place to try it out. The Victorians loved afternoon tea. In fact, they were totally obsessed by it. 
they were so obsessed that they not only used tea leaves to make tea, but they would use all kinds of meat and fish, including shellfish, and add milk to it. So what I'm going to do today is to follow a classic Victorian savoury tea recipe made with oysters, but I'm going to replace the oysters with a sea cucumber. This could be the perfect disguise. By turning my sea cucumber into a tea, I can extract every last ounce of its wonderful flavour and completely remove its unsightly appearance from the equation. I first simmer with water and a dash of allspice and filter with a vacuum pump to create a clean tea. It's like nutty note, a slight sort of seafood shellfish note. I think it's nice. Has my culinary camouflage really worked? Will people like my tea and not care where it came from? That's a fishy tea. <laughs> that tastes like soup. <laughs> it's quite nice. <laughs> oh my god, what the hell is that? What is, what is that? <laughs> What is that? Sea cucumber. Oh, they look like slugs. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something else. <laughs> Serving sea cucumber in the form of a tea might just work. And I've decided to completely supersize the idea to create my own mad Victorian tea party. For the first stage, I'm going to refine the tea. So here's sea cucumber. What I've done is taken it and dried it. Drying the sea cucumber concentrates the flavour and allows me to grate it into a fine powder, which I then place in a special tea bag. The Victorians invented the tea bag, so in true Victorian spirit, it's exactly what I'm going to use here. I add small cubes of gelid sea cucumber stock. Finally, some Lapsang Souchong tea leaves will give a subtle, smoky character. And here is my Victorian-inspired sea cucumber tea bag. So, what goes with sea cucumber tea? A sea cucumber sandwich, of course. I'm going to start by making the butter for my sandwich. Victorian times, flavoured butters were all the rage. In here, I've got the gonads of a sea cucumber. This was the part I found particularly delicious at the aquarium. I mix in smoked anchovies, paprika and sustainable caviar. So there's my flavoured butter. Next stage is to make the sandwich. I spread my sea cucumber butter onto some good old white sliced bread and add some wafer-thin slices of actual cucumber. The final touch for this sandwich has been inspired by a rather unusual and strangely interesting Victorian recipe that I came across. Toast sandwich. It's basically a piece of toast sandwiched between two slices of bread. A bit more of my special butter goes on the toast and it's finally assembled. So here is my sea cucumber gonad toast sandwich. Perfect for any vicarage tea party. But to turn it into a full Victorian afternoon tea, I need some fishy cakes. First, I'm making a Battenberg using salmon and lemon mousse. For the marzipan layer, I've got to slice the brioche. And to cap it off, fondant fancies made from crab and sustainable cod cherry bakewells. What will my diners make of my Victorian inspired sea cucumber afternoon tea? Served actually like oh, afternoon oh, tea. Oh, how beautiful! Wow, it does look like afternoon it's tea. Little <gasps> buns and petit four. Oh my goodness, that looks so You've got like a bakewell tart on top. Oh my goodness, it says sea cucumber tea. Yeah, but You're it's got some sort of there. gelatinous fishy thing in there. I like to leave my. I'm a oh, bag what in is guy. it? This doesn't taste like tea. It tastes more like it tastes like a, a fishy bovril. Do you know what it's like? It's oh like God. some sort oh of sea God. broth. No, no. You know what? This smells like the tea. It smells like a wet dog. You know when a dog oh, comes in, have a, a smell nice of it. It's like a, it's a wet dog tea. The sea cucumber tea is um, <clears throat> is slightly an acquired taste. It's a mixed start. 
I hope I can turn them round with my sandwiches and cakes. Very nice. Mm. That is great. That's delicious. really, really tasty. That is absolutely delicious. That is delicious. Oh, that cucumber was great. Yeah, you know what was the but you know what I think was the masterstroke was the bit of toast in the middle. Cucumber sandwich is going down really well. So we go. So we go Battenberg. I'm Battenberg. Right, Battenberg. Yeah. Ice cream. Smells nice. It doesn't mm. smell offensive. Oh. Bread. Mm. Is it savory? Then it's nice. Yeah. Delicious. Is it? It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Oh. Mm. oh. It well, looks perfectly like a bagel. I love. Oh. Oh. It's good. Then. All very nice. Especially the sandwich was gorgeous. I think that sea cucumber yes. could be the new cod. With my fishy cakes and sandwiches a hit, I've got a quintessentially trippy Victorian treat to cap my tea off. I know I am a bit worried. 19th century divers described strange mind-altering experiences when walking on the bottom of the sea. That's really weird. Can you feel it tingling? Oh, yeah, I feel quite weird. Caused by excess nitrogen in the blood, they called it rapture of the deep. Oh, no. I'm giving my guests their own taste using a special gas mixture that includes nitrous oxide or laughing gas. <laughs> <laughs> That's good shit. That is good shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I can really feel that now. I can really feel that now. Here's the rapture of the day. That's what I say. More of that. He's going to have to come up with some bloody good thing Thank now. <laughs> so, my afternoon tea party and rapture of the deep combo has sent my guests into the depths of pleasure. Next, I'm channeling my inner Viking as I take on a terrifying fish that makes a piranha look like a minnow. Stocks of cod have fallen by nearly 90% in the last 100 years off the English coast. We need to open our minds to the large variety of delicious alternative fish, and I believe delving into the past could be the answer. Looking through the history books, I've come across one particular fish, largely forgotten, that's actually increasing in numbers. It's said to be delicious, but it does have a terrifying reputation, not least because it was the culinary favourite of the most fearsome race ever to walk the planet, the Vikings. When they weren't raping and pillaging their way around Europe, the Viking raiders spent their time chowing down on the most ferocious beast they could get their murderous hands on. Everything from narwhals to sharks and walruses were mercilessly hunted down and devoured. And amongst this menagerie of fearsome sea creatures was a monstrous fish known as the wolf fish, revered for its pit bull-like bite and with a reputation for attacking fishermen. Wolf fish is reputed to taste even better than Britain's fish and chip favourite, cod, and is in healthy abundance in the North Atlantic near Iceland. It's not widely available in Britain yet, but major exports from Iceland are planned in the next two years. In true Viking spirit, I've come to the Icelandic West Fjords to hunt one down. I'm 33 miles south of the Arctic Circle, and I've come in search of a ferocious Viking fish. A fish that has teeth in its throat. How on earth do I get myself involved in this? We're heading out into the old Viking fishing grounds, home of the monstrous wolf fish. 18 kilometers of line trail the boat beaded with hooks designed to fit the mouths of the fish they actually want to catch. The sea's quite rough out here, but luckily local chef Jan Myrdal is on hand with an ancient Icelandic sea sickness cure, a putrefied skate and a chaser of black death schnapps. You want me to eat that? Yeah. Is this a traditional Viking food? Yeah, yeah. The Vikings uh, did uh, eat it every day. Sh I shouldn't smell it first, should no. I? No. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'm going to do it. You, I need yeah, that already. Fair, fair. And maybe I can, you know. Okay, OK. 
How is it? Is it nice? Here. Oh. Oh. Do you need? <laughs> Scout? Cheers, whatever. <laughs> oh. How was it? You got any seasick tablets? <laughs> There's plenty of good eating fish on the lines, but so far, no wolf fish. I've heard there's all this sort of folklore about them being able to bite people's fingers off. Yeah. To get, if you get it's, not, it's not a, you know, it's, it's not true. folklore, yeah, it's no, true. It's true, yeah. At last, one of the pit bulls of the seas arrives on the line and it doesn't look happy. Oh, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, please don't. I'm not going to catch it. <laughs> it's, what? it's trying to sink its teeth into the other fish. Yes, We're here. God, it's strong. <laughs> Look at that. Wait, wait, wait. The wolf fish use their fearsome teeth to crunch through their favourite diet, crabs, sea urchins, and mussels. If that is a baby, I would not like to see what a fully grown one of these beasts looks like. They're so strong. There's something very piranha-like about it. It's one ugly brute, but I can't wait to taste it. We've been invited to a special Viking ceremony tonight, and I'm serving up wolf fish. My tiddler isn't going to feed many people, but another boat has managed to land some whoppers. Just as I'm about to fill it one, I feel something sharp and strange in its stomach. Look at that, it's just shells. It's shells, it's just been crunching. Yeah. No wonder you don't want to get your fingers stuck in that mouth. <laughs> You think about it, how big is a fish's bottom? <laughs> there are pieces of shells like that. If yeah. you had to pass those out when every time you went to the toilet, you'd yeah. be cross, wouldn't you? You'd be really bitter and angry. Yeah. Wolf fish fillets are common in the Icelandic diet. The head is usually discarded. But I've discovered that historically this part of the fish was particularly prized. So I'm going to try on the flesh from the head at the ceremony tonight. It's a nice, meaty cheek, then. So, eventually, I've got as much meat as I can get off this head. I've got the jaw open. I want to keep it simple, so I'm just lightly sautéing the wolf fish in butter and seasoning with salt and pepper. OK, so I'm going for my first taste of wolf fish head. I think I'm going to go for the... Palette this bit first. That is fantastic. Tonight's ceremony is an ancient Viking tradition to mark the height of the long sunless winter. In ancient Norse times, animals were sacrificed and eaten during the ritual. So I'm going to try my offering of wolfish head. What will these modern-day Vikings make of this delicacy prized by their ancestors? How do you like it? It's very good. Yeah. Very tasty. Yeah. Huh? How is it? It's good. Yeah? It's very good. Yes. Your fish. Mm, that's great. He likes it. Yeah. A proper Viking. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, See what, if it's good enough for real Viking, it's good enough for me. So I salute the wolf fish. It might have a face only its mother could love, but wolf fish head tastes delicious. Will Brits really think this monstrosity measures up to beloved favourites like cod and haddock? To find out, I need to take wolfish to somewhere completely entwined in Britain's love affair with eating fish. So what better place to come than the seaside? I'm at the spiritual home of fish and chips, Brighton Pier. 
and I'm about to give the British public their first taste of brutish wolf fish. This killer Viking fish is not the most attractive you've ever seen. So in order to introduce it to the British public, I thought the best way to do this would be to serve it in a way that we all recognise, and that means battered fish, just like fish and chips. And basically, the idea is to take off the cheeks, top of the head, put the soft palate under here, and then get inside the end of the tongue. What we need to do now is batter them, fry them, and then find some keen tasters to try it out on. Right, who wants to try some battered fish head? Oh, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> Excellent. Really meaty. Meaty, yeah. Mm. Mm. Really nice. Mmm. Mm. Mm. It's nice. It's really funny. It's really, um, really moist. moist. Yeah. So far, everyone is enjoying the taste of wolf fish. It's nice. Nice? Yeah. But what will they make of its looks? Go on, then. Oh, my God! Oh, oh. oh my God! That's horrible. I'm glad I ate that before you showed me that. Oh, it's hideous! Give it a kiss. No, it's hideous. <laughs> I think that clearly showed that the British public love wolfish. It also showed disguising it in something like batter is the way to go. But that's nowhere near enough for my feast. Look around you, look at all of this. I need to find a way to capture this, the Great British Seaside, in my feast. To go with my wolfish, I've been thinking about the other things that make a day out at the seaside, and one of my favourites is candy floss. So I'm not going to make just a plain old candy floss. I want to make a very unusual type of candy floss, one that involves fish. And I think the sweet pink flesh of a sea trout will be perfect. So I've come to one of the most sustainable fish farming operations in the world. Tony Smith feeds his trout on specially bred worms, which is far less environmentally damaging than using smaller fish taken from the sea. We can grow fish on protein that we actually produce ourselves. Yeah. So nothing taken from the wild specifically to feed our fish. Yeah. Oops. It's beautiful. Look at the colour of them. So is that fish all right for your yeah. uh, candy floss? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah? Trout is classed as an oily fish, and that's given me an idea of how to make my fish-flavoured floss. The oil in here, or I've been cooking the fish in, is I'm going to take on the flavour, particularly from the fish skin, and get some of the oils from the fish. My idea is to use this fish oil to finish off my candy floss. Now for the exciting part, making my trouty floss. Obviously, this is a big idea. And for a big idea, I need big candy floss. First, I need to spin the sugar. I think I could insulate my loft with this. Hang on, hang on. Here's my oil. Strangely interesting, that. <laughs> That's not unpleasant at all. That's really nice. Nice, isn't it? That trout was delicious, and I'm definitely using it in my main. But wolffish is going to be the star of my edible tribute to the British seaside. I had such a fantastic reaction from the wolfish cheeks that I battered and deep fried in Brighton that I've got to include that in my feast. I batter and deep fry the delicious nuggets from the head of the wolfish. So there's my battered deep fried wolfish cheek. I'm going to serve it in a newspaper cone with some good old fashioned chips. Next, to upgrade my candy floss, I'm using sustainable trout to make a special stick of seaside rock. I have a slice of trout, which I've cured, smoked, and then marinated in beetroot juice, hence the red colour. I pipe on a mixture of cream cheese and horseradish and roll into a cylinder. 
need to harden that up because there's something special I want to do to this. I freeze the fishy cylinder in liquid nitrogen. You must remember, if you have rock when it starts to break apart, split, or you have it in the, in the, in the plastic packet when it's all got squashed. Oh, watch this. So I'm going to let this defrost, and it will still look like it's shattered rock. So it's time to plate up. But given that this dish is celebrating the great British seaside, I can't just stick on a plate. Oh, no. I'm going to put it in one of these. A good old-fashioned beach hut. The base of here, I've got some sand with some shells, painted glass on top. Onto the pane of glass, I'm going to put some sand, but this is edible sand. My sand is made from tapioca and smoked anchovy. I then add pickled seaweeds and some barbecued wolf fish fillet. And then the shards of trout rock. And finally, my cone of battered wolf fish head and chips and a sea vegetable foam. So here is my great British seaside main course, served in a beach hut. What will my guests make of my wolf fish and chips celebration of the British seaside? Before they tuck in, I prepared a little surprise to really get them in the seaside mood. They're going to get a helping of seaside tartar sauce which I've had specially flown in. Oh. <laughs> Maybe we are having gulls. Oh, we're not eating seagull. Are they, are they going to shit on us? No, they're not going to shit on us. Yes! yes. Oh, they are! They ah. are! No! no. Way! Oh, oh, Batten down the hatchet. No. They're carrying live ammunition. No. Do we have to lick it off each other? Oh. Oh. Actually, it's quite tasty. Like nice. It's quite oh. nice. I would never have known that. It's just tasteful. dripped down my face. Oh, please. Oh, What's no. wrong with you? <laughs> stop, will you stop it with the seabird shit? <laughs> oh, my God. oh, it's a captain. What's oh, in look. it? Oh, it's That's a... so cute. I'll be honest with you, I'm beginning to get angry. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's like those little cute, like, changing rooms that you get on the beach, oh, like, from beautiful. the 1940s. I like food in a house, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, wow. Oh, That's incredible. Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. How's the wolf fish? That wolf it's fish fabulous. is so tender and so amazing. Go mix it in with your frost, with That's your good. ocean waves. That's good. That the sand is great. What's in the wok? What's in the wok? It's delicious. It's <laughs> but it does look like wok, doesn't it? It's very clever. It really does. It's really good. Clever. Wow, I love it all. It's so really ingenious. Good. I'm now officially a fan of wolf fish. This is amazing. It is amazing. The wolf fish in particular, I'm moved to tears by. That was absolutely fantastic. The, the presentation of the meal was the seaside. I like the cheeks. The I love the wolf fish. It's quite close to cod, but I think it's tastier than cod. The sound of it unanimously scored a hit with all of them. So my wolf fish seaside scene has been wolfed down. But next, I face my biggest challenge so far turning giant crabs into a giant dessert. It's time for dessert, and in Tudor times, sweet ingredients were often combined with fish to create unique dessert-like dishes, including salmon fruit pie and pike biscuits. I want to revive this amazing tradition for my feast. I just need an ingredient to do it with. And flicking through the history books, I think I might have just come up with a surprising candidate, crab. But I want to use sustainable giant king crabs, made famous in another historical era. Bizarrely, these enormous crustaceans were introduced into the Baltic Sea by murderous Soviet leader Joseph Stalin as a way of feeding his starving population. The Man of Steel might be long gone now, but his giant red crab army has since exploded in numbers and become a pest, marching forth across the Atlantic. 
We'd all be doing the oceans a massive favour if we ate them. I believe that the natural sweetness in crab could help create an amazing dessert. I've come to deepest, darkest Oxfordshire to find the man I'm hoping can help me catch crabs. Hugh Coulthard is paving the way to bring king crabs to Britain's tables. Hugh? Here you are. Why are we going upstairs? Well, didn't you know it's the best place to get crabs? This isn't your average shellfish shop, but then these aren't your average crabs. Hugh's brought home three red king crabs for me to choose from. When you pick it up, you've got to get right underneath it and watch your fingers because he'll put his claws underneath. They can grow up to six feet across, but even these smaller ones look like monsters to me. I would say that is a good-sized crab. Now for my first attempt turning crab into a sweet delight. I'm going to modify an old Tudor recipe for a fish biscuit. A local bakery is the perfect place to do it. Morning. Morning. I borrow their biggest pot to boil my giant crab. Then I use the copious sweet flesh from one of its legs to mix into a shortbread dough, which then goes into the oven. And to finish that off, I'm going to make a syrup using the shells. I coat the undersides of my biscuits with the crab syrup to add extra flavour. It's quite crabby. <laughs> but there's something in it. There definitely is. You can get all kinds of delightful cakes and pastries here, but what on earth are the staff and clientele going to make of my king crab cookies? Sweet, syrupy. Nice combination. Mm. Really nice, actually. It is bizarre, mm. but it is delicious. Yeah. <laughs> A crab biscuit is certainly not an expected combination, but it worked really well. Everybody loved it. So mixing seafood and sweetness really does work but I can't just serve my guests a biscuit for dessert. I want to scale up the idea and create a completely edible coral reef. And for the first stage, I'm making the ultimate crab biscuit. So what I've decided to do is create a caramelised crab biscuit. So first step is to take the crab, roast the shell and basically make a stock. Then reduce that stock down until you're left with something so concentrated, it's effectively crab bovril. I mix my crab bovril with flour, maple syrup and butter. Add egg whites and blend. So now I need to spread it out onto this non-stick sheet. Pop that in the oven for about 15 minutes. The cooked biscuit is broken up to be blitzed with a special non-sweet sugar. Reduce that down to a powder. As well as doing a crab powder, I've done exactly the same thing, but flavoured with seaweed. The refined crab and seaweed powder goes back in the oven. Once cooled, my biscuit is ready. And you can see it's incredibly thin and nice and crisp. My biscuit's just the start of what's to become my edible coral reef. So I'm making candy coral using sugar mixed with seaweed, which I put into a vacuum chamber. It's sucking the air out, so it's, it's, it's sucking this caramel up like a souffle. So here is my bubbled sugar coral seabed creation. Next, I'm going to make a chocolate starfish. I pipe a mixture of raspberry sorbet and chocolate ice cream into a starfish-shaped mould and set. For the mouth of my chocolate starfish, I'm using a raspberry. There's one thing left to do to turn this into a proper chocolate starfish. I need a chocolate coating. I spray on orange chocolate and add biscuits crushed with crystallised seaweed to the base. So, time to put my coral reef together. I've built a rocky outcrop in one corner of my feasting room, on which my chefs and I place all the aquatic treats. 
Oh, oh my God. Oh, my God. Oh, I told you. Oh. I knew it. Can we come with you? Oh, can we come? Are we following you? Is it here? It's the coral rock bed. Crab biscuit, delicious, very crabby. Oh my goodness! Crab biscuit is good. Crabby in the desserts working really well. Try the starfish, dude. Oh, the starfish! It's bleeding. It's sorbet. Oh my goodness! There's chocolate and raspberry in it. Oh. Oh. Is it a chocolate starfish? Oh <laughs> because I don't mind sure eating that's... some of the people's chocolate stuff this year, but I don't want to be eating Heston's. <laughs> I mean, I'll lick it once. <laughs> I ain't going in for seconds. We're like in some sort of dessert coma. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Oh, my God. That's insane. <laughs> that's insane. I mean, for me, Heston's chocolate starfish is the best dessert I've ever had in my life. I've got food all over my clothing. Yeah, I've got I'm seagull shit all over me. <laughs> I've got chocolate on my shoes. I've got, <laughs> I've got, I've got, I've got <laughs> gas in my... I've got the bends. It's an unequivocal success. No, he can't get it off. Yes! <laughs> I have absolutely loved it. My taste buds are going crazy. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect, and I could never have dreamt of a meal like that. It's like a whole assault on your senses. Look, I love what he does, but he's a weirdo. With this feast, I was trying to show to my guests the unbelievable range of seafood on offer. And if we just broaden our horizons, if we're just prepared to try a wider range of foods, just some of what our ancestors were prepared to eat, we can go a long way to saving our oceans. But for help in finding and cooking the sustainable seafood that Heston used, go to channel4.com slash fish. Sunday night from 9, Channel 4, Gordon Ramsay and the huge controversy surrounding the shark fishing industry. Shark bait is one you need to see. Uh, next tonight, a race against time for Frank. And let's be honest, he's not exactly fast. Shameless, coming up.